Uh, okay, everyone, what's up? Goldie here, and I'm going to be going over the uh, nine-game main slate that we've got on Tuesday, April 25th here. Um, we do have a five-game turbo slate. We're not going to go over that. Um, I tend to talk too much as it is, so um, unfortunately, it's not a full six-gamer. I don't know what DraftKings doing over there, kind of screwing around with the schedule, but... Uh, they dropped the Colorado Cleveland game from that slate when it starts a half hour before the other game. So uh, kind of frustrating there, but just a five gamer on the, on the turbo, um, you know, jump into the, the discord. I'm sure uh, plenty of people will be punting. Um, so on the, on the main slate here, I've got some, I'm going to say this every day, interesting tournament games here. I think um, we've got some arms, we certainly don't have like, ooh, top tier, you know, Spencer Strider type aces on the mound here. Well, I don't, maybe maybe we do. Joe Ryan, he's been excellent. Um, he's got two new pitches that he's brought from drive line and sweeper and a split change. They've been fantastic for him uh, in in the swing and miss, and really neutralizing a lot of the uh, a lot of power. And he, he always had K-stuff, really good fastball. But now that he's got two more just top-tier pitches uh, in the sweeper, in the split change, uh, he may very well be a, a Spencer Strider type ace here. So we got him going against the Yankees, second time he's seeing them this season. Nestor, uh, on the other side of that game, probably just want to be getting to pitching there uh, in most scenarios. We have a Justin Steele um, at 10,100. He has cracked... The $10,000 mark, uh, kind of insane here because he gets a pretty bad matchup against San Diego. Um, is it a bad matchup? I don't know. We'll get into it. Spencer Turnbull and Eric Lauer probably get to some Lauer on the mound here in the Detroit-Milwaukee game. Um, talked about Matt Boyd last night. He was good. And we can target Milwaukee a lot of the time because, well, their offense kind of stinks. Um Eric Lauer on the other side, he's still got K-stuff, gives up power, but Detroit also stinks. So uh, we we'll probably get to a, a decent bit of him. Brian Hoing is coming up for Miami. He is not making his debut. He is a young arm, uh, but he had he debuted, I believe, last year. And um, really, I, I think he's overpriced, number one. He's at like 8,300, I think. Um, unlikely to be targeting the Braves today. Uh, with a, a really young arm. He's a bullpen arm, um, and not totally sure he's fully stretched out, to be quite honest. Uh, JoJo Gray gets the Mets. Now, um, we're not totally sure who is starting for the Mets just yet. They haven't officially announced anyone, but uh, DK is projecting Jose Buto, as is uh, Fangraphs, a couple other places, um, have Buto on the docket as well. So we'll see. He's only made two starts in the bigs. We'll get into the numbers or what we have. Uh, JoJo has been a little bit better, but we're not going near him against the Mets. Um, you're probably going to want to get to some Mets stacks today, I would I would guess. Josie Barrios, this is a... Oof, um, I, mean, I hate playing this guy. I like playing him when he's cheap against very right-handed heavy lineups. Uh, he's not so cheap today. He's 8,100. But this is a pretty righty-heavy lineup over here in the Sox. Um, I think you can stack them because they're basically free. They allow you to get to anybody you want on the mound. Um, and there's still some variance here with Jose Barrios. They have some lefties, a few, that they could uh, that could make like diff difficult for Jose Barrios. We, so we'll uh, we'll get into that. Um, down in the Oakland LA game, a lot of runs scored in that game last night. Uh, we get Mason Miller. Uh, I'm really excited to finally play him, and we'll uh, we'll talk about him when we when we get down there. Griffin Canning on the other side, uh, also an interesting interesting tag coming in on him. High median projection so far with some ownership as well. So could be um, you know down in this lower range, we've got a bunch of guys really projecting at about the exact same freaking number. Uh, Canning leading the way at 6,400 but all at very low ownership so far. And I think that allows us to get to, I mean, most of these guys we don't want to play. Jake Woodford, Turnbull, Jose Buto, we don't, we're not going to want to deal with. 
Um, JoJo Gray, we're not playing, right, against the Mets. Brady Singer, maybe. Um, Ryan Nelson, maybe. But, uh, I mean, Clevenger, you're not playing. So there's really only two, three guys down here, maybe maybe four, um, that you could consider getting to into some tournaments. Um, JoJo has, has K stuff, but, you know, you, you just can't go after him with the Mets. Um, or against the Mets, rather. So, interesting decisions I think we can make down here in tournaments uh, on the lower end. And that's why we're seeing mostly spread ownership here at the top. If we're seeing it down at the bottom, we're probably going to see it at the top as well. You have Snell, Morton, Lauer, Nestor, Steele, who is getting completely ignored kind of at an insane price tag. He was 6000 in his first start this year. So, um, And that was three weeks ago. Might be getting a little carried away. Uh, Joe Ryan has been excellent, though, as we as we talked about. So let's uh, let's just get into the games and see if we can get through all of them um, before I lose my voice. Hey, eh? uh, so let's uh, start with White Sox and Toronto again in their second game of the series here. Clevenger on the mound. I, I very rarely play Clev anymore. Uh, Sunshine just doesn't have the same K stuff that he used to over in Cleveland. Um, now, it wasn't – I mean, I, I believe he did have an arm or a shoulder injury, elbow maybe. Um, but he also was out for a while with like a busted ankle or, or a foot or something. I can't recall off the top of my head. Um, in any case, the K stuff hasn't been there in aggregate for him over his last, you know, 133 and – in two thirds innings here, right? Uh, only an 18 and a half percent K rate. And he was in the, in the low to, to mid twenties um, when he was over in Cleveland. So this is a quite a precipitous drop off for sunshine. And now the, the fastball mix is still good. It's really the secondary pitches that are lacking pretty sorely here. Slider curveball mix is, is awful. Um, no value whatsoever. We got a huge sample here. It's not that he, can't really throw it for a strike, right? He's not walking people necessarily. Um, he's just giving up contact, right? Pitching to a full 78% here on the barrel a little bit at, at 9% with some hard contact to the left side. 188 ISO, just 20% K rate. They're not hitting for a lot of average there, so there is still a little bit of swing and miss, but he's got an elevated walk rate north of 10% to them and giving up 1.8 homers per nine. So a lot of variance here to the left side of the plate, and that's because he doesn't have a good changeup and he doesn't have a good curveball. Now to the right side, the, the strikeout stuff is even worse, to be honest, and it's sub-17%. Now, the control to the right side is much better. Just 5.5% walk rate. Hard contact rate way lower down at 23 24%. This is a great number. So if we're going after Clevenger, we mostly want to get to him with some lefty pieces. That's where the power is going to come from. And But we can mix in a couple righties here or there. They'll hit for a little bit more average, and that's because of the lack of a good slider. right? So he doesn't have a good whiff pitch to either side of the plate, which means it forces him back into the four-seamer cutter sinker mix. And while they're okay, uh, sinker still pretty good pitch for him. They're, the four-seamer and the cutter are still just about league average, slightly better than, than break-even value. So um, with the, the lack of breaking and off-speed stuff, it's going to put you back into fastball counts. And fastball count everybody in, in, in baseball – can hit 93, 95 now um, at this level. So that's why he gives up so much contact and, and why he is susceptible to some power. So we want to give up uh, or get to him with, with power lefties, and that's really just Dalton Varsho, maybe a Brandon Belt. We saw Kevin Biggio get into a ball last night. Uh, we talked a little bit about Lance Lynn's susceptibility to the left side, and even though Toronto doesn't have a lot of lefties, Anybody with a with a bat standing from the on the left side of the plate is going to make it difficult against guys that or four guys that have power problems to the left side. And these numbers are nearly identical to Lance Lynn's. Not as much hard contact, but the homer number is the same. The ISO number is the same. So we can attack Mike Clevenger as well. Um, Seventy seven hundred. Now he he did have a, a pretty good start. 
against Houston, where he went five innings, struck out eight. But clearly that looked to be an outlier so far. That was his first outing this season. In his next start against Pittsburgh, he goes five and a third, strikes out one, right? And then gets Baltimore and Philly in his next two outings after that. Strikes out five against Baltimore in six innings, which is great. And then goes just three innings against Philly and strikes out one. So um, a lot of variance still here with with Clevenger. And he's probably going to be, well, not on the short list. uh, Probably on the outs for tournament builds here today. Just worried about upside because... Toronto, they, they still are, are just striking out at about a 22.5% clip so far. Walking a little bit at, at 9%. That's buoyed by, of course, Vladdy, uh, Dalton Varsho, and, you know, guys in the middle of the lineup that aren't as swing and miss happy as perhaps a, a Bo Bichette or somebody. Uh, but hitting for some power. This is a good lineup over here. 111 WRC plus so far. Good bit of hard contact, 32 north of 32 percent so um difficult to go after this list as we saw yesterday even a very good matchup for lance lynn in terms of going after the righties as i mentioned those couple of lefties good or not good aggregate numbers or not i should say they made it a little sticky for him so similarly we might see a little bit of that with jose barrios as well he's he's got problems with the left side and we've been attacking this for at least the last 200 innings, um, and it, it really hasn't changed. Now, he has been serviceable in a couple of starts. Against Tampa Bay, he was, what, 7,200, and he went five innings, struck out six. It was a good outing from him, but really that's the only serviceable outing so far. Now, he did go seven against Houston in his last start uh, at the same $8,100 price tag, struck out just three. So... He's still going to have problems with whiff stuff. And Houston is overall a pretty right-handed heavy lineup. So with the righties, as we see, he's still only at about a 22-23% strikeout rate. And that's average. But when you flip it over to the left side, that drops to 18%. To the lefties, 30% hard contact, it's okay, but it's it's right over the meat of the plate. 9.5% barrel rate, 1.9 homers per nine, 214 ISO to lefties. So despite the fact that Chicago, similar to Toronto, not having a, a whole hell of a lot of super threatening left-handed bats with you know, no Yohan Moncada, notably, um, they still have a couple of guys. They have... A Yasmani Grandal, who's got a little bit of pop still. They have certainly Andrew Benintendi at the top of the lineup. Less pop, but very playable price tag here, 3600 Oscar Colas down to 2400 in the 7 at the bottom of the lineup. Um, so they've got a couple of lefties here that they can mix in and make it a little difficult. And, of course, they've got some right-handers that don't strike out a whole hell of a lot against righties either. Notably, Aloy Jimenez, Luis Robert, he's the only one you got to pay for. Everybody else is under 4000 So I think this is an intriguing tournament stack because they're so cheap, not because they're going to offer a hell of a lot of upside necessarily. This is still a decent matchup for Berrios in that regard, in that overall, the White Sox are just not going to hit for a whole lot of power. Um, but they've got some pop here. Jake Berger, Grandal, as I mentioned, Aloy, Andrew Vaughn has pop. And certainly Luis Robert. So they've got some guys that can get to him um, from the right side of the plate and at least turn the lineup over and get to these lefties that can make it a little bit more difficult to him. So, or difficult for him. So I think this is an intri- intriguing tournament game. Um, I think we'd play some White Sox again. They didn't quite get there yesterday. Um, but I think they may be sneaky again today. Uh, probably a little bit better matchup for for Toronto today uh, in terms of you know batted ball matchup. Clevenger it doesn't have near the strikeout upside and, and whiff stuff that Lance Lynn does, for example. So Toronto likely to be a, a good tournament stack uh, once again. 
And you can play some Jose Barrios. I don't want to get too crazy with it because, I, frankly, I don't trust the guy. Uh, I'm going to need to see more than you know one or two decent outings from him uh, before I start jumping on board. Um, and overall, we talked about this yesterday, the, the White Sox are still striking out at basically the exact same rate as as Toronto. So uh, batted ball-wise, a little bit of a, of a difficult matchup here. So if his ownership steams... Um, I'd probably come in under. I think this is a fine number to come in with the field and, and take some shots in tournaments and also play some White Sox and some Blue Jays. Um, probably no Clevenger here since I'm concerned with the, the raw upside in a really bad matchup. But I think you can play three of the four sides of this game. Uh, okay, let's get to JoJo Gray on the mound for the Nats. Taking on the Mets in... Uh, it's City Field. I almost called it Shea. Um, it's still Shea Stadium to me. JoJo has been serviceable uh, a little bit. He's throwing the four-seamer a little less. Uh, and that was really the, the pitch that was getting him totally destroyed here. As we see, this value for him on the on the four-seamer at a large part of the arsenal uh, was just... I mean, this is one of the worst fastballs in baseball. Super straight, right over the middle of the plate, leading to a huge barrel rate and like outsized numbers in 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 power allowed 306 iso this number still hasn't come down even though he's suppressed a little bit over his last couple of starts right went five innings in his first start against atlanta did give up the five runs but he was fine in his last three starts got colorado for six innings the angels five and two thirds and then baltimore for five innings now the strikeout stuff was really only on display against colorado and that's not really difficult right um at a full K an inning. So the strikeout stuff is, unfortunately, that's going to be, um, that's going to go a little bit by the wayside because the four-seamer can be a, a fine whiff pitch for him, but un unfortunately for JoJo, like, he just can't throw it. Um, like, uh, the whiff stuff on the four-seamer isn't all that great, and it's not all that regular. Uh, it's more often that, he just can't throw it for a strike. When he does throw it for a strike, he's just throwing it um, in too hittable a location, even though he can get some, some swing and miss on the pitch. But as we see here, if he's not throwing this four-seamer, where is he going to go? Uh, he like The cutter here should be where he goes with it uh, because the slider actually is plus value for him. So he should be migrating a lot of this usage over to the cutter. Not sure we're seeing that just yet. But you can't go to the sinker. Sinker's a bad pitch. He's going to float that too. So still a lot of susceptibility here for JoJo. And it, Well, number one, we're, we're just not going after him uh, on the mound because he gets the Mets, and they're striking out at an 18% clip in 550 PAs against righties this season, 12% walk rate, and... JoJo's got a 10% walk rate himself. 57% strike one rate, not enough chase in order for him to get out of problems that he puts himself into or that he gives himself. Early in the count, you need chase. And despite having league average and, and plus pitches here in the breaking stuff, uh, the changeup is bad because the four-seamer and entire fastball mix is bad. So that's a terrible recipe here against the Mets. I think they're going to be a, a pretty good and viable tournament stack tonight. Um, despite the fact that JoJo is trying to make improvements here and he has survived, but um, I think he might be a, a bit overdue for a, a nine spot here soon. And, and the Mets can certainly put that on him. Um, Decent tournament stack here. I haven't looked at prices. I suppose we can look at prices. Uh, they're very attainable. Of course, still Brandon Nimmo at the top, 43. Starling Marte, 52, is very playable. 51 for Frankie Lindor like this. Pete Alonso, 6,000. Uh, it's expensive, but this is a really good spot for him. Uh, so you can turn over the lineup here with a lot of guys. Some cheaper pieces, Brett Beatty, Danny Vogelbach down at the bottom of the lineup. Um, they can turn it over for you as well. So... A lot of ways to get to the Mets and get different with it. Um, in aggregate, they're hard to stack sometimes because they don't hit for a lot of power all the time. But uh, we saw in good matchups, specifically against uh, Oakland, and I believe it was Caprillion. 
It could have been somebody else. Um, they put up a real crooked number and put up like 17 or something. So they can get going, and, and full stacks can get you there with the Mets. Jose Buto on the mound, I believe. Uh, we're not totally sure yet. They may do some all kinds of shenanigans. Show, who knows what Show Walter's going to do. Um, short sample on, on Buto. He did make one spot start for them earlier this season. And um, off the top of my head, I think he only went four or five innings, uh, something like that. No overwhelming stuff here. And honestly, you might be able to get to a couple of Nat stacks on the other side, or at the very least some pieces. They've been a little bit sticky against right-handed pitching in the early going here, 540 PAs. Sub 20% strikeout rate. Now 67 WRC plus. Let's not kid ourselves, right? 092 ISO with a 7% walk rate and a 274 Woba. Like, this is pretty bad, okay? So we can target these guys with uh, pretty much impunity. But uh, Jose Buto probably not going to be long for it here today. And we have mostly a full slate and some arms I think we'd probably rather get to... Um, at $200 more expensive, for example. Uh, we'll get to him in a little while. Um, but I think you can play a couple of, of Nats teams here, and it's not like a top-tier stack, but a, a good secondary stack, I think, um, to consider Alex Call 2700 Like, okay, fine. 3100 for Jamer. He showed some pop. This is a fine playable, excuse me, playable price tag. Joey Maness is down to 35 now. Uh, now we're talking. <laughs> Luis Garcia, he's got some pop and a good catcher piece behind the plate here for KB Ruiz. Dom Smith, they've had him in the two-hole, experimenting up there. Can't play both he and Manessis, but uh, 2200 if you want to go after Buto from the left side, if you'd like. C.J. Abrams, Victor Robles, they'll turn it over. Um, if they can get on base, they've got speed down here. So a little bit sticky can be the, uh, the Nats. Um, and I think this is a fine secondary stack here to consider. Uh, against the Mets, but you're definitely going to want to be playing the Mets. Okay, so now we've got uh, Miami calling up hoeing. Um, 8,300, we're just not dealing with this. Uh, came mostly out of the bullpen last year. Now, they do have him um, stretched out, I believe. Now, let's uh, let's see if I can double-check this over here on the other monitor. Um, yeah, he, uh, well, I mean, stretched out enough. Um He's gone 17 to the third in four starts in the minors this year. And, I mean, you can do the math. That's not even, what is that, four and a third, four and two thirds per start. So um, not overly stretched out. And at 8,300, I think this is a, a total non-starter price tag. Um, he's had trouble throwing strikes in his brief appearances here in the majors. Mostly a two-pitch guy, but a two-and-a-half pitch guy, if you will, Um we can look to the Braves once again. I talked about them a little bit yesterday, uh, attacking the walk rate of Eddie Cabrera. And if if Hoeing's going to come up here and do the same thing, walk the whole country, I mean, we could be looking at a um, another big-time bullpen game and an explosion from the Braves once again. Now, they are expensive still. Uh, 66 now for Acuna. He didn't do anything yesterday, which is kind of surprising when they put up a 12 spot or whatever. Um, Matt Olson, 59, still really aggressive for him. Austin Riley, this is probably the best price-adjusted play uh, of these top guys. Sean Murphy's been fantastic, really seeing the baseball, um, really seeing the high fastball, really. He's tomahawked a few a few balls uh, here in the early going. So you got to pay for this top four. Ozzy Albies back down to 4,300, very playable here. Once again, Eddie Rosario got into a ball finally. Looks like he might be getting a bit more comfortable with some more ABs under his belt, and they're keeping him right in the five hole. And uh, that's a very playable, super cheap piece here, um, in, in addition to like Sam Hilliard, who hit two bombs last night. You can get to some of these cheaper pieces down here at the bottom of the lineup and include Eddie Rosario to uh, offset your expenses, so to speak, at the top when you get to Acuna, Olsen, Riley, and Murphy. Um, I like Ozzy Albies here at at 4300 It's a good price, and it's warm in Atlanta today. So we can get to the Braves again. They're probably going to see a little bit more ownership. It kind of happens after a team puts up a 10 spot, um, and they get a, a pretty... 
attackable spot the, the following day. Got to lay 230 on him. Um, I think this is probably an all right parlay piece today. Um, really, they've got Charlie Morton going on the mound, and he's attackable with left hander so you can get to some jazz, um, which is and it's some jazz, maybe some uh, Luis Arise. Right there, but they're they're mostly pretty right-handed heavy. We saw what Strider did to him last night. Um, it, it's a little sneaky though over here because Charlie Morton's got such susceptibility to the left side. He gives up a lot of power, man. Two sixteen ISO, twenty six percent K rate's fine, but a one point nine homers per nine as well, similar to a Lance Lynn and a Mike Clevenger, right? A Jose Barrios also. Like, these guys give up power to the other side, and it's because they don't have a very good changeup. Now, Charlie Morton's stuff anymore, like, he's only got one good pitch, and it's the curveball, and that's why we've seen so much variance out of Charlie over the last couple of seasons. The K stuff is still showing up, and that's because he's getting so many whiffs on the curveball. But pretty uh, pretty big negative value across the board with the four seamer sinker mix and the slider change. Um, he, he's only got one workable pitch anymore. He's having trouble throwing strikes and spotting everything. So he's starting to put guys on base a little bit more often. And then when we get into the power issues to the left side of the plate, that can make it really difficult for him. Now this is the Marlins and they are still striking out at a 25% clip against right-handers this season. Um, that's it including the 17 strikeouts from Strider last night or whatever. 8600 this is a playable price tag for Charlie Morton. I'm worried about the ownership here, to be quite honest. I think there's some other guys that we might be able to get to, in tournaments at least, um, in this range that do not have four bad pitches of the five that they throw. Um, he's got one good pitch. Now, he gets probably the best matchup. Um, I don't know. That's debatable, but this is a, this is worrisome for me. I think Charlie may be uh, really coming toward the end of the end of the line here. So um, now the K stuff is still there, admittedly, and it's still fine against the right side of the plate. He'll give up north of 30% con hard contact, however, does induce a good bit of soft from the righties. So that neutralizes all of the power. Just 128 ISO there. And a high K rate. So it's still fine and it's still serviceable. The called strikes, or excuse me, called strike whiff rate is still north of 30%. And it's one of the best number, one of the better numbers in baseball, I should say. So, like, don't get me wrong. We can still play some Charlie Morton. But, like, he's got some underlying metrics here that are suggesting that uh, he could he could start putting himself into some trouble High barrel rate, sneaking above nine nine percent now. Mentioned the hard contact and the and the real susceptibility to the left side. Um, Marlins only have a couple of guys from the left side that can make it difficult, but those are two damn good hitters against right-handed pitching, Jazzy and Luis Arise. Luis Arise been dealing with a, a bit of a finger issue, um, but I mean we don't really worry about that. He doesn't strike out if he's back in the lineup. Uh, that really kind of takes me off. He's he's one of the few hitters in baseball that can take me entirely off a, a starting pitcher because he's got like a 7% K rate, and he's starting to hit for a little bit more power, and they have Jazzy there. Um, so I don't know. At this ownership figure, I am not super crazy about going after Charlie and and the Marlins. Um, admittedly, a very high median projection so far, and if this is the median projection at the end of the day, then he's he's flat underpriced. I mean, can't deny that. Um, so he, he is a workable piece in some tournament builds. You might be able to consider him in cash if Luis Arise isn't in the lineup. But don't forget about this this bad fastball mix and the bad slider change mix. Uh, this is this can make it difficult on him, and it, which is why at least this season. Um, we've seen a little bit more variance from Charlie Morton here in the early going. So um, hasn't quite showed up just yet, the 9K, 10K game. And he's had some okay matchups. He's seen San Diego twice. He's been striking out a lot. Uh, St. Louis in the early going, he was also seeing them. Um, 
and, and they hadn't been great in the in the first couple of weeks of the season. So that was an okay matchup for him. And then he, he also saw Kansas City. He's been giving up a little bit of production, and he's walking people. Two, three, two, three walks in each of his four starts, and below a K in inning. So um, can't really ignore any of that stuff just yet. But uh, it's, it, it's fine. I think we can get to him because, after all, this is the Marlins. And definitely playing the Braves. Probably just a couple of Marlins pieces on the other side. Okay, we're uh, we're yapping here, so let's just get to a quick one, I think. Uh, Spencer Turnbull on the mound for the Tigers. We're not going to be going near this. Now, 5,200 is a good price tag. Let's uh, let's let's get that out of the way, number one. Um, and if you need to get up, get all the way down here at 52, I'd rather just pay another 500 for Miller. We'll get to that. Um, but we can't. I, I think we still need to see a little bit more from Turnbull. He's had some a couple of encouraging outings. I believe in his last two, um, that he's gone deeper into the game without getting totally picked apart. Now, he had a bad matchup against Cleveland. He's had a bad matchup against Toronto, bad matchup against Boston, and a bad matchup against Tampa Bay. So this is a markedly better spot for him in general. The Brewers, though, they'll still hit right-handed pitching pretty damn well. 23% K rate, 110 WRC+. 163 ISO so far, and a 338 Woba with a 10% walk rate. Um, that's that's still hard to get through. And in the early going, in his four starts, 18 and a third here, 10 over 10% walk rate. And it's not because he's not throwing strike one. It's it's because he's throwing 17 pitches and he's not throwing pretty much any of them for a strike outside of the sinker. Uh, so the breaking stuff and the off-speed stuff hasn't been good so far. Still a short sample, and he's only seen, whatever it is, 85 hitters. So we got to see a little bit more from Turnbull, and it is an intriguing price tag. We saw that Matt Boyd could pick through this lineup a little bit. Um, they'll be able to get their their big left-handed power bats back in the lineup again today. Uh, Yelich will be back. Rowdy will be back. Um, who else do they have from the left side? Jesse Winker, Bryce Terang. They'll make this a, a pretty difficult spot for Turnbull to just walk through um, as easily as Boyd did last night, even though they got a, got him for a couple of dingers. So no Turnbull on the mound. And really, I don't think we can get to any Tigers on the mound either. Um, I'm going to just victory lap. The Tigers won a baseball game yesterday. I'm not going to do it for the rest of the season. So uh, I, I'm, I'm going out while I'm ahead. Um Brewers on the other side, we can play some Eric Lauer, definitely. He still has K stuff, and his main problem is that he gives up power, and it's mostly to righties. Now, they only have a couple of righties over here in the lineup, notably Javi Baez, who is, uh, well, he doesn't really have the, all that much power anymore. Uh, Torque has pop, of course, and all their other righties are, well, not, not great to say the least. Unfortunately, Miggy has reached the end of the line. Um... Like, he's the stone minimum now, and <laughs> kind of crazy that we are saying that about uh, Big E Cabrera, one of the best hitters of this last generation, but um, the production certainly isn't there for any of the righties anymore uh, for Detroit. So, um, difficult to want to go after them tonight. Now, they do have an Eric Haas and a Jake Rogers, right? Uh, that. Guys that have a little bit of pop still, and so don't be surprised if Jake Rogers gets Eric Lauer today. He'll still give up power to the righties, um, bad or not. Matt Veerling has a little bit of pop. So these are maybe a short stack of like a Veerling bias just because of the price and a torque or something. Mix in a Jake Rogers or an Eric Haas here at the top of the lineup. That's fine if you want to go after Eric Lauer because his ownership is admittedly pretty low right now and I think it's a um we'll probably expect this to steam a little bit throughout the rest of the day because he's essentially projecting the exact same as Charlie Morton $200 more expensive roughly the same ownership but I think this is a markedly better spot for him than it is for Charlie Morton because Tigers here in the early going short sample 150 PAs 30 percent K rate against the left side 58 WRC plus we kidding um, so they're very attackable once again, and I think we can go after some Eric Lauer here. We, this is an, a fine price tag for him, um, and to 
a lot of the power issues that he runs into, similar to the lefty issues that we've talked about for a couple of guys already today, he displays the same, uh, just to the right side. 37% hard contact rate, 1.7 homers per nine, and some barrels just to the righties with a 205 ISO. But the K rate is still there, 24% there, a uh, little less swing and miss um, to the left side of the plate, which is very interesting. He's got a decent slider here. So the fact that he's not inducing a lot of swing and miss um, is kind of curious. It's probably because he's throwing the, the curveball. is just not a very good curveball. Um, naturally, he just doesn't throw a lot of the change. And that's what's leading to the power to the right side. The cutter is about break even for him. Kind of surprising that this is not all that great a pitch. He's throwing the slider a little hard, though, uh, given where the fastball velocity, or the, the cutter the fastball velocity is uh, at, at just 89. So it's basically the same pitch here, but it's a little straighter as the cutter. So um, that's why he's really not, I, I, I guess, inducing a lot of swing and miss to the left side. Admittedly, like this is still the Tigers. We could still go after them. Um, so I think this is a fine spot to get to some Eric Lauer. Uh, do we want 50% of him? Eh, let's slow down. But uh, I think you could play a couple short Tiger stacks and definitely some Eric Lauer. I'd certainly side with him. And absolutely some Brewer stacks as well. I'd like to get to them against Turnbull. I need to see a little bit more from him before I'm confident, even paying 5200 for him. Okay. Nestor Cortez and Joe Ryan this is a pretty damn good pitching matchup. Don't think we're going to be targeting any offense here uh, outside of a maybe a judge. But Joe Ryan, as I mentioned at the outset, he's, he's brought in two pitches now. He's got a split change. These numbers are not going to reflect the totally revamped arsenal. Uh, as we see here, the splitter... Um, relative to all of the pitches that he's thrown in the last couple of st or the last season plus, um, it's going to show up as a, a pretty low usage pitch for him here, uh, and he's not he's still not throwing it a whole hell of a lot, but there's a lot of value on it here in the early going. Um, still not categorizing the the sweeper at least from the data that I, that I'm pulling in. Um, so it's not displaying here. There's a little bit of noise in it. Sometimes it gets categorized as a slider. Uh, sometimes it doesn't. It, and just like a raw sweeper. Um, I'll make those updates, of course. But nevertheless, he's still got the good four-seamer, which has always been an excellent pitch for him. A lot of swing and miss. Spots it very well. Doesn't walk people in, and stays off the barrel, which is really strong because, he, because he's a heavy fly ball pitcher. And I think it's only 42 degrees or something, once again. And, yeah, 48 degrees in, in Minnesota tonight. Um, I think it's a, an attackable spot, once again. He's getting the Yankees for the second time this season, and he pieced them apart pretty good in his first outing. Uh, let's see. It was two starts ago, about a couple of weeks. Went seven innings, struck out ten. Um, now, he was 8,800 there, and this is 10-5 now. So we got, we got to be aware of that. Uh Initial ownership on him, actually this morning it was <laughs> it was north of 40%. Um, it's coming down throughout the day here so far. And if this continues to tank, because of the high price tag, I think this is still a very playable price, a very playable spot. He, these two pitches here, um, even though the Yankees have seen him already, they're unlikely to have been able to develop a game plan to fully adjust to it. Uh, so he's now got a really workable four-seamer split change and a slider slash sweeper mix. Three really good pitches. And this is a, a really workable arsenal for Joe Ryan. He's made the necessary improvements. He also went to driveline. And this is where he developed, um, like he had to make these changes because he realized he needed a little bit more uh, to be a front end of the rotation starter, and, and he's really done it. The, the, these pitches are there for him. Uh, that said, you can you can target the Yankees, and you can play some Yankees because they have upside. But let's not kid ourselves. 25-26% K rate in the early going here uh, against right-handers is that's like we saw what Sonny did to him last night. He went a full seven as well. Um, you know, this is a very attackable lineup. This is not the same Yankees here missing all of their big power bats. And honestly, you'd probably see the K rate go up a little bit because Stanton strikes out. So does Donaldson. 
both of them at a north of 25% clip themselves. So this is a very attackable lineup over here. Uh, they have not been good so far, creating below average, 97 WRC+. plus, Hitting for some power, but not walking nearly as much. Average WOBA, and it's overall not very impressive. Hard contact, yeah, sure, but um, you know, still a, a really attackable list over here for, for Joe Ryan. So I think we can target some of him on the mound and play him in some tournaments, definitely. We've got to be aware of the ownership, but uh, fundamentally the spot is is very strong. Nestor on the on the mound for the Yanks, um, 9,900. Now, we like Nestor, right? He, he obviously has the K stuff, 26% in aggregate, doesn't walk people, and he stays off of the barrel. Uh, also a fly ball pitcher, and we generally don't like stacking against fly ball pitchers pretty much at all, especially guys that have K stuff. So we're not going to be targeting any offense here unless the ownership on these guys just super steams. Um and this is a target field. It's a kind of a pitcher's ballpark anyway, and it's less than 50 degrees, so no thank you. Uh, give me Nestor on the mound as well. Now, the, really the only issue that we're going to run into with Nestor is going deep enough into the game. Um, his last two starts have been more encouraging. First couple of starts as he was getting warmed up, five innings, five and a third. Went seven against Minnesota in the same start two weeks ago. Got them for seven Ks. Gave up just two runs. Did hit two batters. Control is normally uh, not not a big issue for Nestor, though, so we don't really have to worry about that. Um, and then went six innings again. Got the Angels for seven Ks as well. So it looks like he's warming up a little bit, and in the six and seven inning um distance is is in the tank now so that's really historically the only thing we've had to worry about uh with Nestor that he's only going five and a third or five and two thirds or so but if we can get him north of six then I think the upside is there at, at 9900 we know that Joe Ryan has that um so we're not worried about that necessarily that's really the only concern but the stuff and the fundamental spot is is fine twins here in the early going against lefties, striking out at an alarming clip as well. 28%, 278 Woba, sub-150 ISO, and a 76 WRC+. plus. Not walking either, so it's going to be difficult to for the Twins to put a lot of people on base and and for full stacks to get there against Nestor, even if you want to try and hedge uh, some of this uh, heavy Nestor ownership. So, um, like both arms on the mound here, really no offense for me. Maybe some singleton pieces, but uh, pretty unlikely. I think there's probably some better spots we can get to. Um, here's also an interesting pitching matchup. San Diego and Chicago. Snell on the mound at 8,500. I hate playing this guy. I just hate it. <laughs> I'm going to say it every every single start. And honestly, I'm not all that intrigued about this matchup for him either. Once again, seeing elevated ownership. And, I mean, Cubs have been pretty damn good, you know? Like, here in the early going... Um, they've been a kind of a sticky offense. Now they're going to swing and miss a little bit still. Sure. 25%, 8% walk rates, average hitting for some power though. 175 ISO 353 Woba with a 121 WRC plus. That's strong. Very strong. Huge line drive rate, 26%. That's a, that's a, a big issue. And against right-handers, Blake Snell in particular, has a 23% line drive rate. So he he could be susceptible to giving up the baseball on a line here. 153 ISO to the righties, obviously a 31, 32% K rate. The strikeout stuff isn't in question here for Blake Snell. It's not the swinging strike stuff. He's got one of the higher swinging strike rates in baseball. Called strike rates, way, way down. So that keeps his CSW number under 30% at just 28.5, which is a pretty average average number and for a guy that's got this kind of swing and miss stuff this should be way way higher the problem with him is that he can't throw freaking strikes he throws so many damn pitches he only goes about five five and a third every single start uh, so he's super frustrating to play and I hate playing him at high ownership um, now the upside is is there so you kind of have to have exposure to him pretty much in, in all tournaments that you that you play on every slate that he's there because and, and, and definitely in good matchups 25% K rate against lefties for the Cubs is 25% so you kind of have to have a little bit of exposure but 
it's it's exposure where you come in under a full quarter of your teams definitely uh given the other arms that we have on the on the day um and you don't watch a game because he's outrageously frustrating he'll give up a lot of hard contact really to both sides of the plate now it doesn't translate to anything over the wall just yet but i mean i mean i say just yet it's 150 in example I'm not sure if it is going to translate to homers, but hard contact is hard contact, and and barrels are barrels, and you can't really fake those numbers. When you put people on base for free by throwing so many pitches and elevating your pitch count, you decrease your own upside of your of your K stuff and your swing and miss stuff. Now, the slider is a fantastic pitch for him, but it's the four-seamer that is bad, and the changeup is... When the four-seamer is bad, the, the changeup is commensurately bad. Curveball is just marginal, break-even relative to league, to league average. So he's got one good pitch, and that's why he struggles so much, because he has trouble spotting the four-seamer deeper into counts. It's not that it's not strike one necessarily. He starts off a lot of guys with the slider, because that's his number one pitch. Um, but he's incredibly frustrating to play, especially at high ownership. I, I really don't like doing this. Um, and given a, a lot of the other arms, it's often that I, that I just kind of bite the bullet and, and fade the guy and hope it doesn't burn me. That may be one of one of those days today. I'm not sure. Uh, I do like targeting high strikeout pitchers with high strikeout teams, regardless of my bias. But, um, man, he's, he's irritating, to say the least. Uh, Justin Steele on the other side, 10-1. Yikes, man. Um, it's like, we like this, we like this guy. We like this arm. He has a league average fastball. Like, it's fine. He's a similar arsenal over here to Blake Snell. Uh, throws the slider curveball, little bit of a change, but he also mixes in a sinker, which is a decent value. And that sort of negates a little bit of the negative value that the four seamer, um, gives him right now. He's got the same sort of susceptibility that Blake Snell does, he's going to elevate his pitch count by walking people and not throwing as many strikes as he really needs to. Now, the difference here, the major difference between Snell and Blake and uh, Justin Steele is that Blake Snell is a fly ball pitcher, 087 ground balls to fly ball. We don't want to target him with lefties pretty much at all. He's elite there. It's the righties that he's got an 075 ground ball to fly ball against, right? And the hard contact. Justin Steele on the other side, he's got a 190 ground ball to fly ball, huge ground ball numbers to both sides of the plate. Also, large K numbers. Now, the walks are a bit of a concern to same-handed hitters, which is kind of curious because the slider is a really good pitch, good value for him, but nevertheless, like a 190 ground ball to fly ball is a 190. Um, you can't fake this, and he's got a 2-0 ground ball to fly ball to the right side of the plate with a 24%, 23% K rate. Doesn't give up any power to either side, so I'd much rather pay the extra 1600 and and get to Justin Steele at a quarter of the ownership in tournaments because the projection it, so far in the early going is the same. You know, it, rel- I mean, it's effectively the same. Like, we're talking three quarters of a point for, I mean, it's one out, right? on DK. So, um, give me Justin Steele over Blake Snell at this current ownership level, even though I hate the price tag on Steele. This is like, we're getting a little carried away here because this is still a a pretty difficult matchup over against Padres. 300 PAs now starting to converge against lefties this season, 20, 21% K rate, not walking as much as you would expect with Juan Soto and his 18% walk rate or whatever. Um, so, but with Tatis over here, he's going to destroy left-handed pitching, as will Bogarts and Soto. He, he hits lefties well, I mean, when he hits them. Um, Nelly Cruz still has pop from the right side, et cetera, et cetera. So they've got right-handed hitters over here, Manny Machado, um, who are going to make it difficult on lefties. So given the elevated price tag and the, I mean, for guys over 10000 uh, you kind of want to see this pro- median projection a little bit higher. I'd rather just get to Joe Ryan, to be quite honest. And it seems the field kind of agrees. We're seeing 5% uh, or a 5x higher ownership on Joe Ryan to Justin Seal right now, which makes him a good tournament play. 
but this is undoubtedly a, a pretty bad spot. Um, I'd like to get to some some of him in tournaments. I, I like, excuse me, I like this stuff. I like the K stuff, but it's a it, it's a tough matchup here, and I'm not super crazy about going after Blake Snell with hitters a lot of the time. But you can always play some righties against him. And you can always play some stacks because he will elevate his, his pitch count and walk some people, and that's how we want to uh, really target pitchers on the mound. It's with walks and hard contact. You can certainly go after Snell there. So uh, prefer steal um, and little offense. It may be like a Padres, but uh, like, I don't know. I'm not super jacked about that. I am super jacked about playing Mason Miller, though. 5,700. Unfortunately, we're not going to get him at the Stone Men, uh, but... This kid is one of the top pitching prospects in baseball. Um, went four and a third in in his first start, and uh, whatever. I, I don't care. He's he's fully stretched out. He is a starter, and this kid has 103 in the tank. Um, as you can see, he averaged 100 miles an hour on his four seamer. He's got a wipeout slider at 88. He could even throw this harder. Um, DeGrom style at 92-93. Hard, hard cutter as well. Change up is a, is a work in progress. Didn't throw it a lot, but he, he really wasn't in the game all that uh, all that long. Just four and a third. Did give up a couple of runs, walked a batter, but he should be a little bit more calm. Um, and he gets a little bit better strikeout matchup with the Angels here than he did against the Cubs, even though he still struck out five. Um in his uh, in his initial outing. So Angels so far, they made a frustrating offense, even though they put up some runs last night. It was mostly from Brand Drury. 23, 24% K rate, 97 WRC+, plus, 157 ISO, and a 313 Woba. High walk rate, it's mostly because of Otani and Trout, but um, pretty, pretty average numbers, and I don't particularly care because 100 miles an hour with a wipeout slider is 100 miles an hour. Uh, with a wipeout slider. So uh, give me this kid. I am jacked to play him at super low ownership. Uh, I love I love this stuff. Um, been watching him for a, a while now and very excited. He's young. He doesn't have a lot of experience in the upper minors, but this stuff plays at 100 miles an hour with control and with command. Uh, that, that will play uh, at any level. So uh, I'm really excited to play him today. Uh, at very low ownership, um, nobody nobody knows who this kid is because Andy plays for Oakland. So, um, you know, but I think we can attack this three percent ownership. I don't know where I'm going to come in, uh, but this is the guy I prefer down in this lower range. Uh, but like, just be aware, um, I have a, a tendency to jump on some arms, some high upside arms pretty early and have it go badly, notably with like a, uh, a Ken Waldachuk last season, as I alluded to yesterday. Um, you know, that said, like Mason Miller is a, a far better prospect than Ken Waldachuk ever was. So uh, really excited to play M Miller today. Uh, this stuff is, is top tier. He's got just an unreal arsenal here. Very difficult to hit. He's a 6'5", big body on the mound. Um, this is going to be a difficult spot for the Angels tonight. Like Miller a lot. Canning on the other side, 6,400. This is a decent price tag. Um, and in tournaments, I'd, I'd much rather just go down to Mason Miller at this ownership level. 18% uh, so far, no thank you. I, I, like, I know this is Oakland, right? And... And I know that, that Canning has a little bit of of upside. He's always had a decent slider. Um, he's only got the, whatever, two starts here. So the, these numbers are, are total noise. Uh, he's always had a decent slider and a decent changeup. The four-seamer is kind of what's been gotten him, what has gotten him into trouble, easy for me to say, uh, in the past. He's a fly ball pitcher, so we will float it a little bit and give up some contact in the air. Um, and we saw it last night that the A's have a couple of guys that could get to him. Now, from the left side, not as many necessarily. They do have Ryan Noda, who's got some pop. Uh, Jace Peterson, who's got some pop. And who else do they have? Uh, that's pretty much it <laughs> for, as far as power bats from the left side. Um, but they've got a, a bunch of lefties here. Brent Rooker is, is perfectly fine. Flyball pitchers with a four-seam slider mix 
they typically have some power issues and a little bit of susceptibility to same-handed hitters. So um, the changeup is going to keep lefties off balance a little bit. And the curveball will help neutralize a lot of the power that he would otherwise give up to righties if he didn't have that pitch. Right? We've talked about a four-seamer slider mix tending toward a a fly ball mix in 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 terms of uh, ground ball to fly ball ratios. Um, and when you don't have a lot of raw swing and miss, as Canning really never has, he's had an average strikeout rate and average swinging strike stuff, uh, that you, you can be a little susceptible to getting on the barrel to the right side so um, or to same-handed hitter. So that is a, a possibility from the A's over here, like a Brent Rooker, and that's kind of where I was going with that. Brent Rooker's got pop, of course, Asuri Ruiz, he's fine at the top of the lineup. He's going to make a, a decent bit of contact. 2,800. A's are playable once again, especially if Griffin Canning's ownership spikes a good bit. Um, now, once again, we don't generally like stacking against full-on fly ball pitchers, but he's about neutral um, and has been in in his uh, his previous outings the last couple of seasons before he got hurt. He was about an 080 ground ball to fly ball, give or take. So that we can kind of stack against when it, when we get down into the Joe Ryan and Nestor Cortez territory at 060 and, o, and 050 ground ball to fly ball territory. Uh, that That's a little more difficult. Um, but at 080 and, and 1.2, those are effectively neutral rates. So we can go after pitchers there. So if you want to get to some more A's, uh, by all means, you can mix in some lefties now. Tony Kemp is fine. They've got him down at the bottom of the lineup anymore. But... Um, you can still mix in a lot of the a lot of the the righties and go after some Griffin Canning. He'll give up a little bit of pop. Intriguing price tag for sure. So I think having some of this in tournaments is fine. Um, you could consider playing this in in cash as well if you get down there. Probably want to get to two upper arms with higher strikeout rates in general. But um, I think this is a fine tournament play. Would probably come in underweight at this current number. This is a little bit high and much rather get to Mason Miller. Um, really the only concern that we'd have is, is Miller going a full five or even six innings, but, uh, give me a little bit of the A's here. Once again, uh, I certainly do like canning, um, like his upside as an arm, but not overly thrilled with that current ownership. Okay. Let's try and get through this last couple of games quickly here. Brady Singer on the mound, 7,200, uh, 24% K rate for Brady. Last few starts though have been, yeah, yeah, yikes. Um, he got picked apart by the Braves, uh, gave up eight, I believe, uh, his final three innings in that start were fine. They just, but they, they <laughs> forced him out there for, uh, for a full five and let him wear it after he gave up, uh, whatever it was, eight in the first two innings. Um, I think they jumped on him for six in the first inning and then he only gave up two and then he was better in the, in the final th few innings, uh, but gave up five against Texas in his last start as well. Walks are kind of creeping up here a little bit walked three in his start against Toronto uh the control against the Braves and and the Giants were both good but he gave up five runs eight runs there as well and walked three against Texas where he gave up those five runs that I mentioned now some of the K stuff is still there but there's a lot of variance with Brady Singer here um good sinker slider mix keeps him on the ground generally but if he's floating this sinker and it's up in the strike zone and floating the slider and not spotting it there's variance with these two pitches because they're they're about league average value. Uh, so he can certainly give up a crooked number. If you want to get to go right back to the D-backs, even though they were quite disappointing last night, uh, go ahead. If you want to play Brady Singer on the other side, go ahead. I think that's fine as well. In the early going here, still, despite their poor evening last night, sub-20% K rate, 97 WRC plus for the D-backs. 164 ISO, and we saw that guys are going to, when they get on base, they're going to try and, and move runners, um, Corbin Carroll and Jerry Perdomo in particular. So you probably see Josh Rojas back tonight, just got a day off, as far as I know. Um, but plenty of guys down there, Jake McCarthy, they're going to try and get him going. Young hitters there that they they may still be missing a um, a Christian Walker. So you could see some shenanigans again with the uh, with the lineup. But uh, keep an eye on that. 
Um, if you do get an Evan Longoria in here again, I think he's an okay play because he's kind of cheap. And Brady Singer actually is exhibiting a little bit of a reverse split in terms of strikeout stuff. Um, that's because he's floating the slider a little bit. It's not just a wipeout slider that it kind of needs to be. But mostly giving up all the power to the left side. And that's a, uh, a pretty significant disadvantage here against Arizona, who have about 14 left-handed hitters, um, all of whom have pop. And they all have speed. So not, I'd, I'd say, a markedly worse matchup for Brady Singer here than it was for Brad Keller yesterday. But, um, you know, despite the elevated strikeout rate, I mean, this is an interesting tournament spot and it, an intriguing price tag for sure on Brady Singer at sub-5% ownership. Yeah, by all means, um, you know, give me... Give me 10%, give me 8%, whatever, uh, on Brady Singer here. I think that's fine to include some of these teams. On the other side, Ryan Nelson. He's been kind of up and down a little bit so far in his first four starts. Um, he's throwing more strikes than any of the other guys in the any of the other young guys in the rotation for the D-back so far. 7,500 for him. I think this is an interesting tournament play as well. Um, the Royals, we've been attacking them all season with right-handers, and... We just couldn't do it last night because Tommy Henry, is, well, he has trouble throwing strikes, and the best hitters from the Royals really hit from the right side outside of Vinny. 25, 26% K rate to the righties so far. This is a big sample, 55 WRC+. plus. I'm not sure it's going to be this low all season, but, man, this team has been bad. 108 ISO with a 254 Woba, not walking at all, very undisciplined and impatient at the plate, making a little bit of hard contact, but, like, it's mostly on the ground here, not on a line, so not creating at all. I think we could probably consider some Ryan Nelson pieces. I'm not super thrilled about a 7,500 price tag and a 19% K rate in general, but I I think there's a little bit of upside here. He's giving up some power so far to the lefties, and that could help the Royals turn this lineup over here a little bit. This this WRC plus at 55, uh, that's gonna come up. Um, don't think the Royals are nearly as bad as the Tigers, for example, because uh, they do have some lefties. MJ should be back. Uh, Vinny, of course, hits both sides. Really, This is a really good hitter over here, Vinny. Uh, Michael Massey got a start last night. Um, high upside college bat. Uh, not just like a, a draftee that they threw right into the pros and, and he finally made it. Um, this guy's been playing ball for competitive ball uh, for a, a real long time. He's a good young hitter here. He's got some holes in his swing for sure, but um, they're going to stick with him because they, he's got a lot of uh, really high upside hit tool. Uh, Franny Reyes is back. They didn't have him in the player pool yesterday. He was on the paternity list or the bereavement list or well, one of the lists. Um, he is back and back at 2,700. Certainly some of the most power on the team up there with, with Salvi and, and Bobby Witt. Uh, Kyle Isbell, playable piece for you here as well. So I think you can play both sides here. I'd probably side with the Royals once again. Um, just because the, the strikeout stuff from Ryan Nelson so far hasn't been all that great. Four-seamer slider mix can give him that that uh, fly ball lean. Changeup is, is okay, but it's still kind of a work in progress here. And in the short sample, it's not been all that great. He used to throw it more, to be quite honest. Um, and it'll help neutralize some of this power to the lefties he's given up. 222 ISO with 19% K rate. Big walk rate to the left side. So worried about him throwing strike one, getting ahead of hitters, as we are with pretty much all of the D-back starters. Uh, so we can get to some of the Royals here. And if you want to go right back to this game, offensively, I think this is perfectly fine. And I think it's almost more viable to play all four sides here than it was last night. And it was pretty viable then. Okay. Last game of the night, Jake Woodford on the mound uh, and John Brebbia. Probably just going to be a bullpen game for the Giants here, I believe, with Alex Wood having gone on the DL. Uh, Jake Woodford for the Cardinals at 5,000. I mean, we're still not doing this. Um, like, I, he just doesn't have any K stuff. He has a 13% strikeout rate, and this is in 67 and two-thirds. Not like a, a big or a small sample we're talking about. This is a big sample. Um now, the suppression numbers are fine because he stays down in the strike zone. Buck 80 ground ball to fly ball to both sides. Doesn't give up a lot of power, but there's no swing and miss whatsoever. And 
that makes him incredibly difficult to play. You need some sort of upside, even at a very cheap price tag, 5000 Now, the Giants are going to swing and miss, but that's really their problem is that they swing and miss, and Woodford's not going to blow it by them. So I think you could consider getting to some Giants pieces here tonight, even though I hate stacking teams on full slates in San Francisco. Uh, we have a slightly elevated run total for them here tonight, four and a half. Same thing with Cardinals on the other side. Um, Lamont Wade, he's down here at 2,700. Kids still got pop. They did activate Mitch Hanniger and who else? Uh, Austin Slater last night. Uh, Jock is back, 4,500, one of the best um, hitters against right-handed pitching in baseball. Uh, playable price tag here for Mitch Hanniger. Always been a really good hitter himself. 4,000 for Michael Conforto. Yaz down here at 37. You can get to a lot of these pieces over here from the Giants. This is an intriguing stack. Um, low probability, of course, because this is in San Francisco, and they do all this platoon garbage, but Conforto, Hanniger, Jock, Yaz uh, are mostly going to be in there pretty much every night. Same thing with J.D. Davis anymore. So um, less platoon heavy this season than they were last year, even though they try and play matchups. These guys still hit the baseball in the air, and against somebody that's not going to throw it past them, I think it's a pretty decent matchup. You could get to, uh, I think it's a very good late sl late slate stack, to be quite honest, uh, on just that three-gamer here. Um, but perhaps playable in some smaller proportions on the main slate as well. Uh, on the other side, we have John Brady, as I mentioned. He is just a bullpen arm for the most part. Uh, they'll give him some spot starts, but these are just like openings. He's at 8,000. You, you just can't go near it. Uh, no thanks. Um, so I generally don't like targeting stacks and bullpen games just because they see so many different arms usually. So it might be a little difficult to get to the Cardinals here. Uh, but of course this lineup has plenty of upside as well. 61 still got to pay for Goldschmidt. That's a little out of control in San Francisco, but, um, it's not like he doesn't have the power to hit it out. Uh, Playable price tags, maybe a little elevated here for them in general. Wilson Contreras up to 47 now. Not super thrilled about that. 44 for Lars is fine. It's playable. Same thing for uh, Nolan Gorman. 47, a little high, I, I would say, in general. Paul DeYoung did come back a couple nights ago. He's been good in the minors. They're trying to give him run and trying to really get him going, but uh, he's been overall pretty disappointing over the last several seasons, striking out a lot. 2500 for him, his price coming up too. Jordan Walker, obviously their top prospect. He's getting ABs every single night. So it's a playable stack, but um, yeah, not my favorite. I'm not really crazy about the price tags. So overall, not super thrilled with offense in this game. Outside of the Giants, definitely not thrilled with the pitching. Uh, but give me some of the Giants here. Maybe not in outsized proportions, but I think they're a playable stack. Okay, that's it. Um... Let's go over stacks real quick. White Sox, Toronto. Give me some of the Sox again, a little bit. Definitely Toronto against Mike Clevenger. Just too much contact there. Uh, Washington and the Mets. Think you could maybe play some small Washington secondary stacks. Definitely the Mets in primary stacks. Uh, Atlanta again, for sure. And Miami, eh, maybe some lefties here against Charlie Morton. I want to attack that. I think he's uh, he's got a significant weakness over here. Eric Lauer, give me mostly him on the mound and mostly the Brewers here. Also, uh, maybe a couple of one-off, you know, right-handed power bats to uh, just dinger hunt against Eric Lauer. Gives up a lot of power there. Uh, Yankees, Minnesota, pitching only here for me. Um, I like both Nestor and Joe Ryan. Not stoked about the price tags. I think I would side with Joe Ryan uh, just fundamentally. I really like these two pitches that he's brought in. I like the price better on, on Nestor, naturally. It's $600 cheaper, but... You know, just kind of whatever. Um, playing both. San Diego and Chicago. Uh, yeah, yeah. I hate playing Blake Snell. Probably going to have to have some exposure. Justin Steele, 10-1. I think is a fine tournament play. But yikes. Admittedly, I, I think the, the price tag is probably a bit too high here. And some of the upside, given the susceptibility to putting people on base and elevating the pitch count, probably a bit too high. Um, not super thrilled about offense, however. But you could get to some really deep tournament stacks there if you want. Nobody's going to be be playing that uh oakland in the angels you can play the a's again give me a lot of mason miller I, i'm stoked to play this kid tonight uh I'm stoked to get my face beat in if that's what happens but uh i'll, I'll wear it i i love this kid super high upside um play some canning on the other side as well 
and probably no Angels on offense for me. Maybe a Shohei, I'd be sure, but um, Trout was awful last night, and he's still trying to figure it out, he, despite the fact that he's kind of warming up a little bit. Um, still frustrating to watch him strike out so damn much. Uh, give me some canning, though. At uh, that ownership, maybe under the field. Casey in Arizona, you can play everybody in this game, I think, and mostly just the Giants, no pitching in this in this final game. So that's it, guys, for now. Um, keep an eye out for the projections. Interesting tournament slate here for pitching on the mound. Keep an eye out for the projections and, and mostly the ownership. See how this fleshes out. I think we're going to be able to play a bunch of different guys and make, get, get to some really uh, good combinations here. So... We'll be pushing updates throughout the day. Uh, good luck to everybody punting tonight.